It's time for another episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is my friend Scott McNamara, and we're going to be discussing his brand new book, Jesus at the Door, Evangelism Made Easy. Scott, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome back to the show. Likewise. Thank you, Sean. Great to be with you. It's lovely to see your face on your beautiful earphones once again. Well, you know, I, I always talk about shiny objects in my intro, and so now I've, I've just turned my head into a shiny <laughs> object so people can't miss me. So, uh, but, but yeah, I think I was thinking this morning, it's been nearly a year since we talked. I, I remember we had a conversation when you were uh, in the early stages of getting, getting to work on this book, and we talked about your ministry. So I'm excited to have you back to tell us about the book now that it's out. Uh, but we've had tons of people subscribe and join the show since we last talked. So I want to start the same place we did last time, and that is by having you share a bit of the Scott McNamara origin story. So for the men and women meeting you for the very first time today, what are some things that they absolutely need to know about you? Yeah, I'm, uh, I guess I'm a testimony of grace. I was a cocaine addict, alcoholic, uh, living a debauched lifestyle. I, I stared down the gates of hell after a drug overdose, and uh, it was there I cried out to the Lord, and please keep me alive, and I'll turn to you, and he did. Uh, uh, and, and I kind of came to this, this new life through the precipice of eternity, through the lens of eternity, realizing what happens to those who die uh, living a life without Christ. And uh, I guess it did something to me. And I decided that I wanted people to know that this was real and, and that they, uh, they didn't want to go to the place that, that I was looking at. And they kind of shifted something in me. And that's, I guess, the, uh, the foundations for this life that I'm living now. And in terms of uh, from when you initially got saved, did you have a heart to evangelize and reach other people right out of the gate? Or was that something that built over time? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I had a heart for, uh, to evangelize. I, mean, I didn't, honestly didn't really even know what that was um, in terms of lingo and language and stuff like that. All I knew is that, you know, I, I kind of uh, I couldn't shut up about this person that I've fallen in love with. It was the honest, uh, honest answer. I was so filled with love for Jesus that I just it just kept spilling out of me. Um, I, that, and then the way I would describe it mostly is that, you know, I, I feel I kind of, you know, w- without preaching, uh, but, but, but using this as a, as an exa- as a way of sharing to the, those that are watching and listening. For me, how can you be held in the Father's embrace so tightly that you can't hear his beating heart for his lost kids, you know? So for me, that's how it was. I didn't go out looking for this. I just got so close to his heart that I could hear it beating for his kids that didn't know him. And, and that was the catalyst for me. Well, and and I I was thinking, you know, in terms of ways that you can get people not to show up to a seminar or a meeting at church, probably talk about tithing or talk about, I'm going to teach you how to do evangelism, and then we're going to go out and do some evangelism. And those are two things that seem to scare people off. Um, So evangelism tends to be neglected by a lot of Christians today. What is it that makes it so difficult? Why do people kind of shy away from that? Yeah, it's it's so true. It is so true. Um, I, I guess, I mean, the main reasons I've found are fear. I mean, fear is a is a huge disabling factor. People are afraid. They're afraid that they, they uh, of what's going to happen, of what people are going to say to them. They're afraid they don't they don't have the skill set or the experience, the abilities in order to faithfully do God justice. Uh, I think these are the kind of contributing factors. And also, it's a bit of uh, a bit of a lack of knowledge. Really, believers, many believers feel that the job of sharing the gospel is down to people like me, uh, the evangelist. And that they don't uh, have a responsibility, where whereas Jesus gave the great commission not to evangelists but to disciples. So actually, we're all called to do it. So I think it's ironing out some of these misconceptions, de- debunking some of these theories, and uh, letting people see that actually they can do it. Well, let's have you get a little bit into what we might call your process for evangelism. That's what you share in the book. So uh, maybe tell us a little bit about how it's developed and maybe morphed and changed through the years? And, and what do those initial steps in the process look like? Yeah, so the Jesus at the door is what we call a reaping tool. <clears throat> so the idea of it is, it's uh, for me, I, I didn't really know a whole lot about evangelism until I stepped, I was thrust into a position as a street evangelist for three years in Northern Ireland. And, and when I stepped onto the streets, I, I was dependent upon the Holy Spirit, which is a good place to be. And I was totally dependent. I said, Lord, I, I don't feel like I'm the guy. I don't feel I'm qualified, but, but I and I'll do it for you because I love you. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Scott, look at all the people milling around these streets and imagine they're like apples on a tree. And when you share, I'll shake. And I had this, this image and this revelation 
what evangelism was. You see, up until that point, I thought it was about how good I was or bad I was or experienced or lack of experience, how many podcasts I'd listened to, how many documentaries I'd, I'd watched. The onus was all on me. But in this moment, I realized that evangelism was an invitation into partnership. And the Holy Spirit was saying, if you share, then I'll do the shake and then together uh, we'll, we'll do the catching and people's lives will be changed. So that was how it began. And then as I would stop a non-believer, uh, my job was five days a week, all day, every day to stand there stopping strangers on the street. And as I would stop a non-believer, the Holy Spirit would drop a phrase into my spirit. And I would say this phrase to, to the non-believing stranger. And honestly, the atmosphere would just shift. It would like become like charged and changed and something would shift. I knew it was something was happening. They could feel something happening. And that was how Jesus at the door was born. It's nine points that were birthed in the harvest fields uh, that were uh, laced in the presence of God. And it began to shift something in our community. We saw thousands come to the Lord. And then this little card uh, that we made it into a card that others could use. And it kind of grew legs and ran around the world, really. Well, and sometimes in terms of trying to reach other people, having spiritual conversations with others, uh, people are really hesitant to talk about sin. So talk to us about in terms of the process that you've developed, how do you, how does sin come into the conversation and, and talk about how does repentance come into the conversation? Yeah, so so it's a great question. So obviously with sin, sin is like the proverbial hot potato. You know, nobody wants to touch it. It's like when we're approaching non-believers, let's don't let's not go there with sin. Um, so we try and do all the other things. You know, we try and keep it very nice and lighthearted and not too deep. Uh, but but for us, we have three points on sin. I mean, our, our, our Jesus of those made up of nine points. Three of those points tackle sin, because frankly, if you don't address uh, sin, if if the individual doesn't acknowledge that they're a sinner then why do they need a savior? So, you know, we really go after sin. And again, this wasn't something, I didn't go into my study, uh, not that I have one, but I, I didn't go into my study or I didn't go into the seminary or the classroom and try and forge an evangelistic technique to win the masses. I stepped out in vulnerability and said, God, if you come with me, I'll go. And the Lord in his, in his wisdom and his providence gave me these points. And I've had people who are very smart people will take our card and I say, this thing is genius. The way that it's laid out and the order it's laid out. Now, I'm not a, a learned man. I, I'm just a simple guy who works in obedience and I obey God and he gave it to me. And, and honestly, um, <clears throat> the power is in, is in the gospel. And this is the way that we present the gospel. So we, we address it this way. We say, if you, um, if you visualize a backpack on your back and we filled it with all your sin, would it be heavy? <clears throat> now, some individuals will say, no, my bag's empty. Some will say, well, yeah, there'll be something in it. And then we're like, you know, surely everyone would have something in the bag, wouldn't they? We're just trying to get them to acknowledge that they're human and they're a sinner. And if they say yes, then we say, well, that represents your debt with God. It stops you having a relationship with them. So that's the first example about sin. The next one, if you owe the bank $10,000 and I gave you a check for that amount and you deposited the check into your account, what would happen to your debt? Again, real simple uh, image laden analogy. Well, my debt would be cleared. Well, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He wrote you a check signed in his blood. And today he's standing at the door of your heart, wanting you to cash it in. Now, <clears throat> if you take away the Holy Spirit, this is empty. But like I said, the Holy Spirit has laced these words and it had been laced in his presence. So there is power uh, in, in each of them. I firmly believe that. So that is how we present sin uh, to the individual. Now, if they say, hey, my bag's empty, I don't want a check. Then, then that's down to them. We don't force anything, but what we do is in partnership with the Spirit, we present the gospel and we tackle sin, he sin head on. We don't hide around it. We go straight to, straight to it. And we find, uh, you know, we see grown men crying in the street and, and, and amazing miracles. My, my daughter's um, 10, but last year she was nine and she went with the pastor of a church I trained in Bend and she walked up to the um, this stranger. She said to the pastor, that guy over there, walked up to nine years of age, walked up to the past, this guy with the pastor, walked him through Jesus at the door. This guy had like a snapback and a pack of smokes hanging out of his pocket, kind of rough around the edges. The guy's crying in, in, the, in the store as he accepts the Lord because it's the power of the gospel. And then um, in terms of hurdles, difficulties, like you said earlier in the conversation, people are very fearful about approaching strangers uh, at all, let alone approaching strangers to have a spiritual conversation. Um, but what are some of the obstacles you've seen through the years? I'm sure you went through a process of having to overcome fear and just get to a place of being comfortable with what's normal and what it's like to approach strangers. So uh, what are some things we should maybe be aware of that we're, I don't know, I don't want to say we need to watch out for, but just 
what does a, a normal day in the life look like when you're out uh, just talking with people on the street? Yeah, I mean, I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, a, a bit of advice I can give you is to uh, get out of the way, uh, to, to give up control. You know, I have a phrase, uh, giving up all control so that he can take full control. That is my definition of evangelism, giving up all control so he can take full control. So it's kind of counterintuitive, really. Uh, we think if we can know our stuff, then we can be we can be fruitful. But actually, the best evangelists are the ones who get out the way. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one with all the power. So if we can move out the way and let the Holy and let the Holy Spirit take control, then you're going to see more power. So the beauty of evangelism in the evangelism that we call a uh, reaping style evangelism is that is it, it is in partnership with the Holy Spirit. So all you've got to do is trust Him enough to get out the way, and uh, and then frankly, whatever happens is not on you. You don't own it. You're not the Lord of the harvest. Uh, sometimes people say to me, how do you handle rejection? And I say, well, you know, I don't own those apples. I, I'm not the Lord of the harvest. I'm just a worker who's putting in a shift. Um, I'm just working alongside. I'm a co-laborer. So if they, if they reject the Lord, that's, that's their issue. You know, if I worked in Starbucks and someone came in and said, this coffee's disgusting, I, I want to put in a complaint. I'm not going to lose sleep over that because I don't own Starbucks and it's not my coffee, okay? I'm not going to take that personal. The truth of it is, is we don't own these people. We didn't create them. Uh, the Lord is pursuing them for a relationship with them. We're just called to go and share uh, and to love uh, faithfully uh, and do that. So honestly, if they reject you or they're not, not, they're not interested, I'm putting all my focus on the Holy Spirit. I'm only going as far as they go. As soon as I see an individual back off, I back off. Um, this is not pushy evangelism. This is just finding where are the apples that are ready. Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. So reaping style evangelism is finding out who's being drawn today and going after those people. Well, I want to make sure I work in a question related to power evangelism. I work in the charismatic publishing space. You do ministry in the charismatic ministry space. So um, I don't know if I want to say your process, your book kind of completes power evangelism, so to speak, but maybe uh, uh, the two can come together and be very complementary. So in, in terms of somebody who might approach your book, thinking it's going to be just a, what we would say is a traditional power evangelism book. How is it more than that? I, mean, I don't know how to I'll ask it other than that. So there we'll go with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's an, it's, I'm glad you kind of asked that because this has been an interesting topic. Um, the, the phrase power evangelism. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm from Vineyard, a Vineyard church movement. Uh, that's my background. I'm a, I'm a supernatural guy. Um, but I'm all, I'm, a, I'm all about the gospel, but, but I believe God, our God is a supernatural God. So, um, G, uh, the Holy Spirit's the best evangelist. He's also the best healer and the best prophet. So the more time you spend with the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to become like him. And, um, and what I feel, uh, you know, for me, when it comes to power evangelism, this has been a little bit of a stumbling block for some people because they've kind of said, well, here's the power, here's the power uh, evangelism. And what we've done is we've segregated it into compartments. So here's the power kind and here's the servant kind and here's the friendship kind. And what we've done is we've compartmentalized evangelism into all these different kinds, but there's only one kind with the power. And that's the, that's the one with the supernatural stuff. But I believe this. I believe all evangelism should be personified by power if it's in partnership. So the Holy Spirit says um, that the Great Commission to go make disciples, the Great Commission wasn't called the Great Mission. It was called the Great Commission because I believe it's an invitation. It's a partnership. Many evangelists or many disciples doing the work of an evangelist don't partner. They go out there and they do, they do it themselves um, because they're afraid and different things they hold on too tight. So if really, really all evangelism should be power evangelism because the Holy Spirit is the one with all the power. And if you're partnering with him, then he's in the middle of it. And wherever he is, there is, there is power. So the fact that we have uh, relegated this thing to, to comp compartmentalizing, we've relegated it to, to different sections shows me how far removed we are from how it should be. Because now we see as this is the power kind, this is that. But frankly, if we would only tune into the Holy Spirit and partner with him, everything you do, even giving a can of Coke as a, as a servant evangelism would have power in it because it's got the Holy Spirit's thrust behind it. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Thank you for clarifying. I know we covered that last time, but I feel like uh, when you're bringing evangelism books uh, out in the charismatic space, it's good to uh, be real specific about what we're talking about. Cause I think people might be expecting one thing. So that was a fantastic answer. 
Um, you know, Scott, in terms of the reader's journey with the book, uh, somebody finishes reading the book, they close that back flap. What's that big idea that you want somebody to take away? How do you hope you influence them, push them out of their box a little bit once they've finished the book? Yeah, I mean, the goal is to put into the hand of every disciple or every believer um, uh, the card, the Jesus of the card, because it's the gospel. So we want to get you partnered with the Holy Spirit. That's our main objective. Once you begin to partner with the Spirit, what will happen is you will become more like him. Like I said, you'll get better at praying for the sick. You'll get better at hearing words of knowledge. You'll get better at sharing the gospel. Like it will take care of everything. Uh, we have a lot of people, um, and I'll just touch on this briefly, Sean. I know we mentioned that last time, but you know, according to the Barnet Institute, 96% of believers are not leading people to the Lord, which means you've got 96% of the church at best who are sowing. You've got 4% who are reaping, which is why we call Jesus at the door a reaping tool. We're going after uh, that equilibrium. We're trying to bring an equilibrium. We're trying to bring a balance to this thing. We, the church is walking with a limp at the moment um, with many sowers at best and not many reapers, which means a lot of people are dying and go to hell. So how do we how do we bring it the, the, the even keel? How do we uh, bring the equilibrium? I feel that we have all these people on the sidelines as sowers looking at people like me who were one of the 4% reapers saying, I can't do what you do. I can't do it. I've never, you know, maybe I've never seen a miracle. Maybe I've never heard a word of knowledge from the Lord. I can't do that. So what I'll do is I'll just clap you from the side. I'll applaud you from the sidelines, but I won't do it myself. Now, what we need to do is we need to lower the bar and we need to say, hey, guess what? To the 96%, you've never seen a miracle. It's okay. You've never heard a word of knowledge. That's okay. Here's the gospel. According to Romans, it's the power of God unto salvation. And what we'll do is we'll get them off the sidelines and then they'll begin to move. And as they begin to move, sharing the gospel with what we're giving them, then they'll begin to get to know the Holy Spirit more. Who is he? The best evangelist, the best healer, the best prophet. And they'll become more like him. And then everything gets a lot more exciting. So that's kind of our objective. At the back of our book, we have... Um, we have a card, uh, you know, our, our Jesus at the door card with our nine points. So the idea is once you finish this book, you can rip that out and you can get going. Uh, we had a review um, on our book on Amazon from a young lady. And she said that this has changed my life because I, I've been praying for ways to share in the grocery store to know how to bring the gospel. But she's like, that's it. I, I don't even need people anymore. I'm going to get this thing and I'm going to go for it. And that's kind of our objective. Well, I love that you guys actually bound in the card into the book. That's fantastic. Uh, Scott, I know you also have a range of merch, resources, pe people can buy extra cards. Uh, what are kind of those top three to five things people can pick up on your website? Yeah, our main things would be our equipping cards. So that's just the, lang the language we use for that nine-pointed card, um, our equipping cards. So we have those available on our, on our website. Honestly, they're a, a little bit nicer than the one in the book. Uh, we have them very glossy and, and a, a bit a lot heavier. Um, so that's our equipping cards. That's the main thing I would suggest. Um, we have follow-up cards also. But you can also get these on the, on an app. We have an app with um, we're very into discipleship making and uh, disciple making and new believer groups. And so we don't just want people to pray. We want to see transform lives. That's our, our desire, which is why we pioneer uh, what's called revive new believer groups, a, a space where these people can come once they pray and they can grow in, in an environment of other new believers. And uh, I just had my new believers group last night. So this is what we love to do. So this is going to help you with that. On our app, we have all these uh, resources also, equipping card, follow up card we have uh, over 30 languages available on our app of this equipping card and uh, we have new believer section where you can record and document all the people you lead to jesus and, and a new believers info their names and numbers stored in your app so we have a lot of uh, uh, things like that but in terms of the website yeah there'll be our follow um, equipping card follow-up card we have tracts which are uh, the nine points explained in a booklet if you're too embarrassed or too shy to read the card you can give them a little comic book and the individual in the comic book will walk them through those nine points uh, we have that too so they're probably some of the main things uh, that we'd recommend uh, if you're really into it you can get yourself a phone cover and uh, that means you're always ready to strike whenever you wherever you go so you have the card there and then you can have the nine points on the app or you can memorize them well and, uh, I, I just had a thought of something else i said should ask you in terms of my normal interview flow, this is way out of place, but we're going to go for it anyways. Um, Scott, I know you went into some of the difficult places that have been affected by riots and just the unrest that we've seen this year. Any stories or testimonies you'd want to share in terms of some of the places you guys have gone in 2020? Yeah, so, I mean, <clears throat> the States has been going through a crazy season, and I've found myself 
uh, in, in close to where a lot of the craziness has been going on. So um, uh, Seattle is only a couple of hours drive from me and the chop uh, chop zone, uh, Chaz zone, as it was called uh, originally, as you guys know, I'm sure that was quite crazy. There was a lot of crazy things happening. Uh, there were people that were killed there and in, in that autonomous zone. So I was invited to go and to partner with um, with uh, my friend Daniel Kalender, who wrote the forward in this book. His ministry, Christ for All Nations, had a team of boot camp graduates who went to take the gospel there. So I partnered with them. I took a Jesus at the door team, and we worked together as two teams. and And we spent um, there was uh, three days uh, on the ground there, and it was incredible to see what the Lord did. I mean, in the in the ground zero calendar. Anderson Park on day, I think it was day two. Um, we were uh, there were our team were baptizing people in an inflatable dinghy in that in that park. Uh, we saw uh, a lot of people come to Jesus. A lot of people accept the Lord. Uh, some of their own self-appointed security guards were led to the Lord. Um, so it was an incredible time uh, that we saw uh, the power of God move there. And it was crazy. There's people getting punched and knocked out on the floor. There's fights happening everywhere. It was literally a clash of kingdoms. And then we went to the Portland riots on two occasions. I took a team there. Um, the first time we went, it was very, uh, it was very, very extremely dark. Well, both times, but the first time extremely dark. We met outside the um, uh, the, the courthouse where the riots were taking place, and there was all these Antifa guys. Uh, you know, uh, crowds of them. And, and I went in with my team and we literally just uh, took the gospel to them. And and we saw two individuals come to the Lord. One was a guy from Ali who'd come in, especially for the riots, a, a BLM guy that was very much involved. And he accepted the Lord. Another guy accepted the Lord on the obelisk where the uh, the witches carried out their incantations at the beginning of the vets and the whole thing. We led a guy to the Lord, stood on that statue and uh, and then we went in the second time with a team of 15, a Jesus at the door team of 15, and we actually uh, took the gospel to those guys. It was crazy. It was the only night, uh, night, night 93. It was the only night that there was no rioting and no violence. It was our second time going in. And we believe is because we ca- we're carriers of the presence of God. So going in there, 15 of us, in the midst of those Antifa people, we, we believe that we shifted an atmosphere. It was crazy. One of the Antifa main guys came over to me and he said, are you going to cause trouble here tonight? Because because he, he knew us from before. And I'm like, we didn't cause trouble last time. We're not going to cause trouble this time. He's like, okay, we know who you are. Uh, just uh, We don't want you causing any trouble. I'm like, listen, we, we just come to bring the love of Jesus. As we walked down the streets, three of the Antifa guys were whispering, talking behind us. They said, do you know that guy? And the other guy was like, no. And then he's like, do you not recognize his accent? So basically they began to be familiar with us because we came in there, I guess with an approach that's slightly different to maybe other approaches. Hmm. Wow. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, going a little bit off script and sharing the story. I always feel like people are encouraged to hear um, kind of the proof in the pudding, if you will, of what it looks like to live live out what they're experiencing in a book, see things actually in motion. So I appreciate those stories, those testimonies. Uh, Scott, for the listeners, the viewers who'd like to connect with you, find out more about the ministry, find out more about the book, where can we find you on the web? Yeah, you can get us at jesusatthedoor.com is our website. And then if you want to check us on social media, uh, Jesus at the Door on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and um, and then my personal account is Scott for Jesus. So all those info, uh, all the info is on there. If you want to check out some videos like the the Chop Zone, uh, the Portland riots, we have uh, we capture through GoPro uh, live encounters of people experiencing the power of God and getting saved and and all kinds of uh, amazing things. So on our YouTube channel is just Jesus at the door, and there's a whole reams of videos, teaching materials, training videos, and live encounters in the moment that you can get on there too. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Scott, where you can pick up your own copy of the book, and we'll link to some of those videos that he mentioned as well. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Scott McNamara. Once again, our book today was Jesus at the Door, Evangelism Made Easy. Again, to connect with Scott, find out more, a great place to start is the Jesus at the Door website. You can find that over at jesusatthedoor.com. And Scott, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been a blast to have you back on the show. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you, Sean.